So Brian is a science communication researcher and training and a, a former lecturer um, at the Dublin City University and a journalist. Uh, he's currently president of the PCST, which is the public uh, communication, uh, mm, sorry, the public communication of science and technology network. And uh, uh, he has a number of publications on the topic. And I wish to mention that Rutledge Handbook of Public Communication of Science and Technology, which, is, uh, uh, which has just released uh, its uh, third edition in August. And uh, uh, so in 1996, uh, he uh, established a master's in science communication at Dublin City University, uh, which was one of, his, uh, of the first kind in Europe. So uh, please, Brian. Thank you. Um, just before you rush out to buy the Routledge Handbook, uh, <laughs> it's uh, actually going to be available next year. Okay. Uh, thank you to the rector uh, for his remarks. Um, if you don't mind, I'm going to quote you, uh, saying, uh, communicating your research with the public changes how you do your research. In fact, I'm going to come back to that later on. Uh, thanks to Jan for his remarks, but I'm going to disagree with you fundamentally about Milgram. It absolutely needs explanation and communication and justification I don't think that experiment would be allowed anymore, and that definitely needs communication. So uh, I, I appreciate the way that you were explaining it was it's self-evident what its importance is, but it's not self-evident that it was an appropriate thing to do then or now. Anyway, uh, let me get into uh, my, I'm gonna need the, Enrico to uh, get the slides up. I'll try using this rather than holding a microphone. Is this okay? Good, okay. So, uh, uh, just very briefly to try and set the scene, uh, but I want to get fairly quickly into uh, the issues that are, meant, that are hinted at here. Um, science communication training uh, is a growth business. Uh, and its growth reflects the growth in science communication activities in general. So science communication, when I first got involved uh, 30 years ago, I suppose, uh, was very much an artisan amateur business. Uh, it, in fact, it was not a business. It was a, an amateur activity and training likewise. I did my first training courses for scientists as a journalist, entirely as an enthusiastic amateur. And now, the same kind of training, uh, or at least with some of the same orientation, is offered on a contractual basis between the main research funder in Ireland and a company that provides training. So that's what I'm referring to when I mentioned that there's now a growing business in science communication training, just as there is a growing business in science communication. I am drawing attention to this not as the strongest trend, but as an indication of how science communication activity is settling into the society that we're part of. Uh, and as part of that settling, it is also being institutionalized, professionalized, and commercialized. Uh, Jan referred to the diversity of offering in communication in universities. Well, equally, we can see a very remarkable diversification of both science communication activities uh, that are now increasingly culturally oriented, uh, artistically oriented, and we're here in Cafoscari, uh, uh, the home institution of Science Gallery Venice, which is about art and science collaboration. Uh, Dublin, I'm proud to say, is the originator of the Science Gallery Network just over 10 years ago. Uh, and that's an increasingly evident and important trend in science communication, which has implications also for science communication training. So we find in science communication training, drama being used, improvisation being used, storytelling being used, and not just the, this is how you do an interview, this is how you write an article, although that also 
uh, is part of, of the picture. But what's driving this growth? Uh, well, partly it is the people and the agencies and the organizations that are involved. The first offerings in science communication training that, uh, that I think we can recognize as part of our lineage, if you like, uh, were offered by professional societies, and professional societies still play a role here. Uh, research funders increasingly require dissemination or something similar of the research that they fund and now uh, are providing uh, training or funding for training. As well as government agencies, we also have, of course, non-government agencies uh, doing this work, universities, foundations, and, as I said, uh, commercial consultancies. The case that I highlight here of the Alan Alda Center is an interesting one. Do you know Alan Alda as a person, personality? Not very well, obviously. Uh, those of you who were brought up in the English language will have seen MASH, and he's a key uh, actor in MASH. He's a tall guy uh, with a very sardonic uh, 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 look about him. And Alan Alda is retired from acting and has given his time and his time is limited because he's quite seriously ill, but he's, he's given his time to training uh, scientists in communication, public communication, at a public university. Uh, but what may not be very evident to you is that that's a trademark, which is a remarkable thing. Uh, that, that to refer to the Alan Alda Center for Communication Science is to refer to a brand and to refer to a registered trademark. That's an indication of the commercialization that I'm referring to. Now, I don't know if we could patent the results of the Quest project, but you might think about it. Uh, but but it's a, a fact to me, it seems like a, an almost like a contradiction in terms, that what you're doing is public communication in order to share knowledge, presumably, and you actually then patent the way in which you do the sharing of knowledge. There's a, clearly, a, 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 at best, a paradox, at worst, a flagrant contradiction uh, in that. Um, but what are the motives for doing science communication training? Among them are the promotion of something called science. And I was really interested in what the rector said about science and culture. Uh, and increasingly, by the way, I mean, there is a journal called Science as culture, not just science and culture, but science as culture. And increasingly, we are thinking of science communication as culture as well. Uh, and I'll refer to that, uh, that again just in, just in a moment. So wh what are we promoting when we're promoting science? Is a way of thinking, a way of assembling knowledge, a way of understanding the world, and a way of finding knowledge, not just a series of proven facts or theories, or results, or findings, but also a way of being in the world and a way of finding knowledge. But one of the things that is driving uh, the uh, increased attention to science communication training is the promotion of individual institutions. So the Scandinavian institutions to which Jan was referring, uh, one of the activities of those 80 and 90 people is uh, facilitating the researchers in various ways to communicate with the public, including mentoring and advising and, if you like, training, although it may not be formally called uh, training. Uh, and one of the reasons why research funders are putting money into science communication training is because they want to see their brand also trained. So the major funder in Ireland is called Science Foundation Ireland. They support training and they require that those uh, researchers who are funded by them make sure to acknowledge their funding as part of their public communication. So there is a circle here of, of, of self-promotion, if you like. Uh, and this is maybe, uh, when we refer particularly to the promotion of institutions, this is maybe a demonstration of what uh, is called in a book, a really important book about science communication by Sarah Davies and Maya Horst. And Sarah Davies is a part of Quest through her uh, uh, role in NTNU, the Norwegian University in Trondheim, is it, or Tromsø, Trondheim? Um, a really important book. They refer to academic capitalism, 
as one of the environmental I mean, ec ecosystem changes that is affecting how science communication is done and why it is done and how it is done. So there's enough activity in this uh, arena uh, for there to be a book about it. Uh, so this book has just come out, uh, Theory and Best Practices in Science Communication Training. It's, it's published by Routledge, uh, like, like the handbook that uh, Alessandro referred to. Uh, it's edited by a, a young academic at Stony Brook University, the one that has the Alan Alda Center, or he was at the time when he started this project. He's now moved to another one, Wisconsin. Uh, and you can get a sense of what it's about from the chapter headings here. Uh, and a key word right at the start, the scientist as a strategic communicator. Now that actually sets the agenda for training in a very specific direction. Uh, and well, I want to just draw your attention to it in order for you to pause and reflect on what that might mean. Because it does actually quite limit, indeed, the range of what communication training might be for and about. Uh, but, but that's a specific American flavor, if I might say. Uh, but American flavors tend to cross the Atlantic very easily, uh, not only in hamburgers, but also in science communication and science communication training and science communication studies. So that's something to think about for the rest of the day as well. But there are people like my colleague in Dublin City University, Declan Fahey, uh, like Fred Balvert from the Erasmus University in Rotterdam uh, and some others who are also taking slightly uh, different approaches. But again, I'm drawing your attention to, what I'm really drawing your attention to the f uh, here is that science communication training is enough of a thing, as young people say in English, it's a thing, uh, it's enough of a phenomenon that there's a book about it, okay? Uh, and that leads me also just to say something to those of you who are practitioners in science communication, which I think all of you are in one way or another, is that there is a body of research around science communication. Uh, and I'm not going to embarrass you by asking you how many people have read the Davies and Horst book, uh, or how many people think they're likely to read this book, but you should be aware that there is formal research going on in this field. And I hope that Quest will, as part of its work, will pick up on what's going on in the research field, and I know already from the round of interviews that has been done, which I was part of, uh, that it is already picking uh, up some of the trends in the research about science communication, as well as in the practice of science communication. But now returning specifically to the forms and shapes and purposes of, of science communication training, there is a default model which was the one that I think I was using 30 years ago, and that's still alive and well. And it's actually expressed in the name of this day. Train the scientist, with a, an exclamation mark. Yeah? And that's the, that's the default model, where you, scientists apparently are bad at communicating. Really? Worse than archaeologists? Worse than historians? Worse than art historians? Really? Anyway, that's the basis on which we're doing this activity, that apparently they're bad at communicating, and we know how to make them better. Now, I'm, I'm satirizing it and making a parody of it to some extent in order, again, to draw your attention to what may be some underlying assumptions in the default training model that need re-examining and need, need careful uh, thought. But what we tend to have is then scientists, scientists as trainees and science communicators or journalists as trainers. And what they then do is they demystify media. They provide them with some tricks and techniques to uh, do interviews and write articles. And somehow, that delivers benefits to the wider public by some magic. Uh, again, let, we should think about that today. Do, do we know what benefits that actually delivers? I think we know to some extent what the benefits are to trainees. I think we know what the benefits are to trainers. It's a very interesting activity as a trainer, by the way. Yeah. And some of this, it's a bit like the, the loop that you were referring to about communicating research, changes your research. It's a bit like training 
scientists to be communicators affects how yourself as a science communicator. The more you do it, the less you know. The, the more you do it, the more you need to know. Yeah. Which is actually like the scientific enterprise itself, in a way. Yeah. But there are other ways of thinking about training and other points of departure. And one is to ask the question, why bother? And we need to ask that question again and again and again because there are so many different possible answers. Why bother? Do you understand the phrase, why bother? I don't, I don't know how that translates, but uh, I hope it's clear. Yeah. Uh, and who is communicating, but above all, with whom? And even the little word with is important as a, an alternative to to communicating to the public and communicating with the public uh, ha have different implications built in. And the public is a mass, an amorphous, heterogeneous mass that needs to be deconstructed and rebuilt, probably as the public's, which doesn't work so well in English as it works in Italian, in pubblici or in les publics in French or whatever. But anyway, uh, you, you, you get the point, I guess. And what are the points of view that we include? Like the point of view that might be an ethical challenge to a social psychological experiment. Is that part of science communication or is that the other? Is that culture? And I guess by asking the question, I'm saying absolutely I think it's part of science communication that the objections that somebody might have to a piece of scientific work need to be integrated into the communication process. And the stronger the objections they are, the more strongly they need to be integrated. That's not the same as saying anti-science or anti-vaccine arguments need to be integrated in science communication. Although science communication training needs to provide those people who defend vaccinations and who advocate for vaccinations with the tools to deal with the anti-vaccination argument, which is part of what Quest's, one of Quest's case studies uh, would be looking at. And we need to also acknowledge that rather than the media being a hopeless case, the media do actually treat science, and by media here I'm talking about what's called traditional media or mainstream media, they do treat science, they do give attention to science. You may not like the way they do it, but they do it, and you now need to understand why they do it, as they do it, and what possibilities there are for uh, changing that. Uh, my own training activity, uh, I always start with the why bother question, and near, that nearly takes up the whole morning, uh, because there are all sorts of interesting answers possible to the why bother question. Uh, because you will benefit is one way of dealing with it. Rather than focusing on the public benefits, supposed public benefits, you, the trainee, will benefit from it. Uh, because you will understand your work, potentially you'll understand your work better. So this relates to what the rector was just saying there about how it changes potentially your, your view of your research. Or if you cannot explain it well, then you probably haven't understood it. And I've actually had many experiences over many years with PhD students and with postdocs who have, as a result of doing simulations within a training context, said, I now understand my research differently. And I think I actually understand it better, or what its value might be. Uh, and that's an interesting and sometimes revelatory experience, which from the normal process of supervision with the supervisor, uh, you know, with the principal investigator or whatever, they might not acquire. And now they have to step outside that relationship and step outside that set of assumptions and answer a different set of assumptions and very often they find actually they have changed their view of the research, changed their understanding of the research, uh, or, or indeed improved their own clarity about what the research uh, gives. These quotations are from a publication of the Research Councils of the United Kingdom uh, about uh, public communication. And you'll see that there's an oceanographer uh, and there's 
or, well, people from various disciplines saying something about the experience of doing public communication that affected how they do their own work and think about their own work. Uh, I won't take you through each of the individual quotes, but I'm just simply giving this as kind of evidence, albeit anecdotal evidence, to support my notion that some of the major benefits of doing public communication are to the person who's actually doing the communicating initially rather than necessarily to the public. To the public. And the public benefits are much, much harder to assess anyway. Much, much harder. Um, so here's an example. Somebody quoted in a, an evaluation study, uh, in a British uh, evaluation study, on the experience of doing public communication, saying that you get a bigger picture by engaging with the public. Uh, and that in the research community, you tend to forget about the landscape, which is the bigger picture. And that's why public input is needed and so on. Okay. So now I'm going to offer you something which I'll leave on the screen later uh, for you to uh, think about, which is to think now about the range of science communication training forms uh, and uh, activities. Uh, don't ask me to explain every single block and why some things extend over three blocks and so on. I might not be able to justify absolutely everything here in detail, but I hope you get the idea that you get from the simplest, if you like, uh, least complex form of training in just who are the media and what do they want, through more specifically science communication oriented, to courses that are offered to undergraduates who are doing science degrees, to courses or modules that are required to be done by PhDs or postdocs, and we discussed this very briefly yesterday in, in, in the smaller uh, workshop, uh, and that's where I've been doing most of my activity in recent years, through to continuing professional development, very often done in the form of what are called master classes, uh, and CISA, uh, which Enrico Valle is from, uh, does master, and, and Chiara, uh, do master classes for people uh, who are in career uh, or no sorry they now do mostly early career researchers but they I, I did take part in master classes which were more for people who are already doing some kind of science communication uh, but I'll give you an example of master classes in a moment right through to full diploma or master's programs like the one in CISA uh, like the one that I was associated with in Dublin City University and what I'm trying to uh, draw attention to is the different kinds of ways in which the training is done, the duration obviously of the training, uh, the general purpose and hoped for outcome of the training uh, here and here, uh, and what kinds of roles those who have been so trained might be expected to play. So here they might be good at doing exposition or promoting an argument or engaging in discussions with people, and here they might be advising those who are doing public communication, or indeed devising strategies for those who are doing public communication. So that's the kind of spectrum I'm, I'm uh, trying to draw here. 20 minutes are up, okay. What do universities do in this uh, area? Uh, and universities, and I've written about this in JCOM, the journal published uh, in CISA, uh, universities do things that are somewhat contradictory. Uh, on the one hand, they uh, act, do training for science communication, which I describe as instrumentalized. So we'll give you the tools and techniques just to do this job of getting that research out. Yeah? Uh, uh, very often with promotional purposes, through to science communication as an intellectual pursuit, as I would regard many of the master's courses as offering. And these can be happening side by side in the same institution without talking to each other. And it's in somewhat of a contradiction or a tension with each other. Uh, and uh, that presents some interesting challenges, if not some problems. Um, it matters. I'm going to focus on, of all these questions, I, I'm going to focus on where. It matters where training and education are done. 
uh, it's an organizational issue and it's also a conceptual and disciplinary issue. So where does training happen? Training of scientists to communicate with the public. Is it integrated into graduate training? And apparently that there are different answers to that, uh, factual answers to that in different places. Is it mandatory or recommended for early career scientists? Uh, is it linked with the communication that scientists do anyway as part of their professional careers? Uh, or is it treated as something completely differently? Uh, and, and, and so on and so on. And all of these are options, and which option is taken has implications for how it works. Uh, in the, the issue about whether it's situated within humanities and social sciences or natural sciences relates particularly to diploma programs uh, and master programs. Uh, and from a humanities and social sciences perspective, or from a natural sciences perspective, different purposes will be ascribed to science communication. Uh, what's it for? What defines effectiveness? And that's uh, a big question for Quest, because the E in Quest stands for effectiveness. Uh, and uh, I've been suggesting in discussions with colleagues that this is a, a difficult term to use and what difficult term to settle on a definition of, no, never mind to demonstrate what effectiveness is. And what's the underlying model of science communication? Now, this is primer stuff in science communication studies. I'm not going to dwell on it, but the idea of a model of science communication is a key idea in the literature, and it's a key idea, I think, in the practice, or it should be. Most of you will be aware of the idea of dialogue uh, as an alternative to a traditional method of science communication, sometimes referred to as deficit communication, okay? I won't go through the arguments here, but simply to say there's more to all of that than merely dialogue versus deficit, okay? Uh, and I've written about this, and this is from a piece of work I did 12 years ago, which I've extended greatly since, where I talk about three main models of communication which are applied within public communication of science and technology in specific ways and which have variants. And funnily enough, yesterday, uh, this issue about de defense of science came up. Uh, and this is the thing the chemists used to talk about a lot. They felt that they were under attack, uh, or rather more that they were being neglected, uh, that nobody loved them, uh, and that they needed to advocate and so on. But uh, there's, there's clearly a, 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 a specific kind of communication going on here uh, and at one end of some sort of spectrum where critique is at another end, where science communication is about asking the questions, why, do you, why are you doing what you were doing and what do you think its uh, outcomes and purposes might be? Very quickly, some case studies, uh, not in detail, uh, from science communication training. Uh, Anna Godinho, who is present, and myself, I think one of the, we, well, we worked together on, in, in Esquinet, which we, we remember fondly, I think is it, fair to say, uh, as a really interesting experience in training early career scientists on an international basis uh, with funding from the EU in a sensational site in Dubrovnik, uh, which was worth it. For the, for the experience alone, uh, where we developed a series of modules uh, uh, which are capable of being offered in different ways, S aiming not just to provide tools and techniques, but to have young scientists think about what their science means in a social sense. Uh, and here is the list of modules and this is available, this material is available to Quest. It's still, the actual module material is, up, is online. It can be found, it can be downloaded, and it can be discussed and considered as part of thinking about science communication training. But you'll see here, it's more than just the default model. Uh, now, it's also fair to say that many of the trainees struggled with or resisted some of the more 
discursive, theoretical kinds of things that were going on in this part of the uh, agenda and really did want the basic technical, practical skills given to them in a handy way. On the other hand, some who struggled at first said it was insightful, it was revealing, it was enlightening, and, and it changed the way in which they uh, saw the, their, their work. Uh, this is publicly available and uh, I recommend it uh, to you. Now, out of Esconet, I came to this university uh, in 2012 with uh, Italian colleagues, uh, Massimiliano Bucchi is there, uh, Giuseppe Pellegrini, his colleague from uh, Vicenza, Elisabetta, who lives, I think, in Bologna, who did the CISA course, I think I'm right in saying. Uh, and we did a training, not in this hall, but somewhere very similar in the other building. Uh, and the then rector, your predecessor, I suppose, uh, was very keen to uh, get this started. I'm not aware that it led on to uh, anything continuous uh, or sustained. Uh, and I guess what I'm drawing attention to here is that although in general there is a trend of growth in science communication training and science communication education, there are also cases where things start and don't continue. And there are also cases where things are proposed to start and don't start. So this master's at Kafoskri didn't start yet anyway. Uh, there wasn't a sufficient uh, interest in it. It was linked to the establishment of Science Gallery Venice. So th there are plenty of ideas out there that still have to find, as it were, a, a, a fertile ground uh, to fall in. Um, University of West of England is very active in this uh, area, not just in providing a diploma and master's courses, but also master classes over five days. So this one is happening uh, next month. Uh, and you get the range of things that are being done uh, here. It's a lot to do in four days. It costs 800 pounds sterling, it's not, so it's not cheap. It's, it's clearly for people who are already working in some kind of science communication role, maybe in a science center, maybe in a research center, uh, or somewhere like that, uh, and want to raise the level of, of their skills. Uh, here's a master's course in Barcelona, and I'm sure your Spanish is good enough to make sense of this, uh, and I'll be giving a lecture there next month. And it's been going for over 25 years, one of the earliest ones in Europe, one of the earliest ones in the world, actually, uh, and it's still, it, it's always had an orientation towards health. It gets uh, uh, students who are typically working already as science communicators, uh, at, uh, sometimes in research hospitals, uh, and, and biomedical research centers, uh, and you can see here the kind of things they offer. That word there, herramientas, is tools. So the tools of communicating science. Uh, but you'll see it's quite practically oriented. It's about how to do communication, uh, and in the case of Delft, in the Netherlands, it's, it's different again. So just as Jan was describing the uh, situation of universities providing uh, public relations and public communication is being very diverse across the continent of Europe alone, never mind the wider world, so the offerings in science communication training and education are very diverse and they reflect their home institutions, uh, the cultures of their own institutions uh, and in this case this peculiar thing here is a kind of innovation lab uh, where the communication students work with engineers and architects and others come up with interesting uh, hypothetical uh, answers to hypothetical uh, questions. Uh, anyway, I've just given you very quickly a flavor of the, of the diversity, uh, and I'll leave you uh, again with that, as that might be a useful way to maybe focus some of the discussion. I thank you very much for your attention. So thank you, Brian, for your very interesting, of course, speech and for offering us this view of the state of the art of uh, uh, science communication today, which somehow helped us to find the answers. We also looked to these key open questions on science communication. And uh, I confirm that uh, uh, mapping the state of the art is also a starting point of a quest project. 
And uh, the reason why Brian knows so very so well our project is because it's uh, part of our advisory board, and of course we are very proud of it, and I think his role in it will be really very crucial. So uh, I just open the floor to your questions. This hall is just brilliant for interactivity. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, let me just try then. Uh, thank you, Brian, for a wonderful uh, speech. Um, and since you are, I'm Ludo Cox from uh, Utah University. We had this meeting yesterday, which was a very interesting meeting uh, on science communication. And since you are quite active for 30 years in science communication, I was just wondering, there are institutions who are quite active and successful in science communication and others are not. What, in your opinion, makes it that some institutions are successful and active and others not? <laughs> Just curious. This may not be very helpful as an answer, but it, it is very frequently down to individual personalities. Um, I mean, I described myself 30 years ago or 25 years ago as an enthusiastic amateur. And I was very fortunate I went to a university where actually I was asked, I came as a journalist with 20 years professional activity, translating over into education. And uh, pretty amazingly, I was asked, what do you want to do? Uh, and I, I know that's not the question that they ask at interviews now. And I said, I'd like to do something in the area of science, and um, I'm not sure I didn't. I didn't know what it was, to be absolutely honest. The term science communication was not being commonly used at that time. Uh, but I was given an opportunity to set up a conference and then a master's. Uh, and, you know, I'm not, this is not the story about me, but uh, there are lots of folks who have had similar experiences. So the Barcelona program is based on the enthusiasm and expertise of Vladimir de Semir, who, like myself, was a science journalist who became a teacher. Uh, and, and so it's sometimes it's just, uh, I've heard this referred to uh, as the power of one. Maybe you know the phrase, yeah. yeah that one person in, in the right time, in the right place, can actually do something. And one of the, uh, and I, I could actually go around Europe, uh, if not, other parts of the world and identify who the one or the two were in many cases that got it going. Yeah. Uh, but of course that means something else. It makes, means that some of these projects are very weak. I've retired. Vladimir is retiring. Uh, Baudouin de Jourdan in Paris is retired. Uh, okay, and I can go around the world and I can find, you know, we were of a certain age. Uh, 30 years ago and we're now 30 years older and we've moved on and what happens then and then it comes down to you know how well settled it is within the institution uh, and that's where the issue about where's the home is really important uh, and although this uh, I'm afraid sounds like it's just m me saying that my experience has been particularly strong or good or whatever uh, I think the logical home for science communication is in communications. And when science communication is a an add-on to natural sciences, you know, as a kind of extension work, it is also potentially vulnerable. Uh, and, and that has been shown in some uh, cases. So it needs enthusiasm and innovation and room for innovation from the bottom up and it needs institutional support from the top down. And where those two come together, then things can happen. Other questions? Jacopo. Jacopo Pazotti, VIU University at the moment. And um, thank you very much, Brian, for your very interesting and straight to the point uh, uh, presentation. And I'm also interested in your kind of historical perspective in your 30 years of experience, and in particular on the concept of reluctance, scientists being reluctant to reach out. And uh, I'm interested in knowing by your experience, um, 
if you have noticed any change either in the proportion of scientists who are reluctant to reach out and or on the motivations why are reluctant. So scientists reluctant today to reach out, do they have other motivations compared to scientists who were not too keen on communicate like 10, 20, 30 years ago? Do you notice any change? Sorry, just one thought has occurred to me about the power of one, uh, and it just allow me to say this because it, it, it won't come up again. Uh, UNAM is a university in Mexico which has as many students as there are people in Iceland, 350,000 plus, okay, and still growing. And it employs as many science communicators as many countries employ. I mean, it's, like, it's a city within a city. I don't know if you're aware of this place, but it's an extraordinary institution. And when I ask UNAM colleagues, how did this happen in this place? They answer one person. And you can, you can try this experiment if you meet a Mexican. And they'll say Luis Estrada, who was a physicist in the 60s and 70s, who, like another physicist in Portugal, Mariano Gago, you know, just took on the communication idea as something to be put into effect. And actually, when somebody like that takes a leadership position, then reluctance is addressed in some way. They, 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 so they, the scientists then have a role model, in a sense. And if they admire this man, and it's very hard not to admire him, uh, then, then, they, they, then it breaks down, potentially, some of the reluctance. Uh, and the reluctance, I guess, is based on a very simple observation, I mean, of, of mine, but I mean, the, the, the socialization of scientists uh, prepares them to do research which impresses their peers. So the public communication element is always something additional outside or beyond their primary role. However, what scientists increasingly are finding in doing interdisciplinary work is that in order to communicate between disciplines, they need the tools and techniques of public communication. So I think that one of the reasons reluctance might be breaking down, uh, and I'm pretty sure it is, is because more and more scientists who have become more and more specialized need to talk to more and more other scientists who are also specialized. And the easiest bridge from one specialism in science to another specialism in science is actually to talk as if you're talking with the general public. Yeah. Now, if this doesn't strike you as obvious, then just listen in to the coffee conversations of scientists who are meeting in. Actually, go into the canteen in CERN. Uh, I mean, CERN, OK, we think of it as being a place about phys physics, but actually it's about physics and engineering and listen to the buzz of conversation in CERN between people who are from different backgrounds, different language backgrounds, and different disciplines, and different experiences, and the way they talk. And you could probably pick up most of what they're talking about because they have to use a common language, which is sort of like the common language they would use in dealing with uh, a wider uh, non-scientific audience. So that would be one kind of complex answer to your question, which is actually to do with how science itself is evolving and how science is evolving within society would then raise other questions about like climate science and you know, medical science being very much open to public scrutiny and, and therefore that's breaking down reluctance. In fact, it's creating a new imperative uh, to communicate with uh, wider publics. Uh, I'm from Université Côte d'Azur. Uh, thank you for your speech. Um, I was wondering, uh, according to you, what is uh, the ideal, let's say, profile of a trainer in science communication? Is it a communication specialist? Is it more like a, a, a science uh, journalist? 
so someone with experience in, in with, or with a background in, in science, or having no solid experience in communication and uh, non, non, no scientific background is uh, maybe um, an advantage as well. I think you've brilliantly answered your own question by gi li giving us all of the requisites. Now, it's unlikely that that one, per one person will encompass all of that, but you need all of those things. And I particularly appreciate the last point you made, that science communication training needs also the involvement of people who don't have a detailed or in-depth scientific experience or knowledge in order to ask what's called the dumb question. However, somebody really dumb called Carl Sagan wrote a wonderful essay saying there is no such thing as a dumb question. Uh, you understand dumb, yeah? It's, it's okay, so stupid if you like, uh, silly. And uh, that's a really important notion to hang on to. And part of training should absolutely be about asking what scientists might regard as dumb questions by the time when they walk in the door but after they've been through the experience, they may actually recognize, no, that I need to actually think about those really blunt questions from time to time. Why are you doing this? Why on earth are you doing this? There's only one person in a million who suffers from this particular disorder, and there's malaria out there. So why are you doing this? These are reasonable questions and need to be asked. So some combination of all of those things that you mentioned, I. I did say that one of the aspects of the default model was science journalists doing the training, and there are a few journalists present who uh, will excuse me if I say this, because uh, I think they'll understand the point, and that is that journalists are not actually very good at thinking about their own trade. Uh, very, they, they may be very good at doing it, but thinking about it and why they do what they do tends to be based on intuition you know, something called a nose for news or a sixth sense of some sort, yeah? Uh, and I was that person uh, at one time, and, you know, it was a huge unlearning or relearning to go into the classroom and explain why you do what you do. And I've had the experience of journalists coming in as guest lecturers with copious notes prepared and finding that they've actually done everything they wanted to do in 10 minutes. Because actually, it isn't natural for them to articulate the why about their, their activity. So science journalists, even, uh, or journalists in general, don't necessarily make immediately good trainers. They have to actually unlearn or relearn many of the things that they take for granted. And I'm looking at two uh, former journalists and wondering if they accept that that might be a reasonable proposition. Yeah. Uh, Marco Bettiolo, Università di Padova. Uh, I'm the head of communication of my department. Uh, one of the problems that I'm dealing with is frustration. Uh, there is a lot of emphasis on communication, especially at least now in Italy at our universities. And there are a lot, I mean, maybe too high expectations. And a lot of my colleagues, they come to me and say, why I don't get a lot of attention from my research because we published something and they didn't work like they thought. It should work. Um, so, in one sense, now there is, a, a, at least in my experience, my little experience, a great uh, need of communication. Uh, they want to communicate one way or another, but sometimes they they cannot uh, handle what you uh, explained earlier about your rec reflexive approach to communication. They th they think it's kind of it's a mean for. Uh, for increasing their ego, pretty much, and, um, and to, I mean, to sustain the publish or perish mechanism. Uh, so how do you deal with this problem that I see a lot, uh, I mean, working in this field? Well, I think that's brilliant that that's a frustration, you know, because I think many people would say the frustration is on the side of the communicators trying to get them to talk to them at all. But if their frustration is that they're not getting, immediately getting press attention, that's a good starting point. Uh, I think it's, it's, it's absolutely, uh, 
I think it's necessary to say to people when you're doing communication training uh, with them that there are no uh, silver bullets. There is no magic formula. Or if it did exist, you and I would not be sitting here. We would have set up a company. We would be selling it uh, with a trademark mark on it. Uh, it. It doesn't exist. And there are no guarantees. And the day that your press release goes out about a fantastically interesting piece of research, an earthquake has just happened. Uh, you know, okay, admittedly, it's only 3.2 on the Richter scale, but nonetheless, it's still an earthquake, and your story is gone. Okay? So that happens. Yeah? Uh, and so a lot of the training and uh, preparation and advice has to be, you know, there, there are no guarantees here. Uh, it's going to be tough. Uh, it's risky. People are going to misunderstand you and are going to come back and ask you absolutely off the wall crazy questions. Uh, but you just got to be patient and you got to persevere and eventually over time you build up a relationship but it is about building relationships so if somebody comes to you and say I've got this fantastic piece of research I haven't spoken to you for 10 years and I'm not going to speak to you again for another 10 years until I've got another fantastic piece of research you're probably better to send them back again send them back to your lab go away because you know, we need to work on this over the longer term uh, and by the way it Communication uh, is not just about research findings, it's also about the process of research. Uh, and that's part of the relationship. And you might sometimes think about inviting in a journalist or inviting in a TV crew or whatever to actually just tour the lab and find out what people are doing, yeah? Before they have this big bang thing. And then when the big bang thing does come, or even the small bang thing comes, or even the no bang thing comes, uh, the, the, the media are prepared for it, yeah? But if it comes just out of the blue, here's somebody who's claiming they've solved the problems of the world, uh, you know, the people, the journalists are going to be uh, suspicious at least, yeah? But I, I think you've got a really good problem to deal with, if that's the problem you have, if that's your biggest one. <laughs> I'm Mara Contardo, I'm a social media manager of the uh, University of Trieste, and first of all, thank you very much for your speech. And um, you uh, actually, at the very beginning of your speech, said that uh, at the very first uh, steps of science communication was an, an, like an artisanal ac activity. Nowadays, it's uh, specialized and uh, institutionalized and commercialized. So, uh, do you think that social media push this or not? Uh, for sure, social media has been a driver. I should have referred to it uh, because, well, it's much more obvious to you know researchers now that there is a wider ecosystem of communication that has implications for them and some of them will decide to do their own thing on Twitter and so on and then institutions need to have policies about this thing uh, actually question to those of you who are representing institutions like you in Trieste and you in Utrecht and you in Antwerp do you have a social media policy for your researchers yes yes not sure uh, kind of yeah but it, I mean, and do people know what that policy is? I mean, that's an interesting starting point because of course there's lots of things that can go really badly wrong before you've even got involved as the professional communicator. Uh, and now what you have to do is clean up the mess. Uh, so yeah, social media is, and the emergence and development of social media in all its various forms uh, is certainly a major factor uh, and it requires training to be reconsidered and redone uh, for different purposes and for different outlets. So, yes, I should have touched on that and just didn't manage to do it in the time. Uh, when I started doing this work, uh, and, and, and you know, people coming in and talking as scientists about their experiences and so on, they nearly always told horror stories. Yeah, they start with a horror story. I once did an interview and I was completely misrepresented and so on. And I suspect that now there's a new generation of horror stories being told by people 
who did what they thought was an appropriate thing on social media, and guess what? People trolled them, and people started arguing with them, and people didn't like what they were saying, and it's horrible out there. Yeah, it's pretty horrible out there. It's risky, it's dangerous, and it's democracy.